Uh, today I want to talk a little bit about something on my mind about operating systems and how they're being taught. Also, some of the existing operating systems that we have that haven't changed in 30 to 50 years for most of them. So uh, to me, that is pretty long in the tooth. But there, you know, there are some operating systems that are being developed today. But I want to talk about an untold story on the commentary of Unix. <laughs> And there's a famous quote that appears in this uh, untold story. So I want to let you know what it is ahead of time. You are not expected to understand this. And that was a quote by Dennis Ritchie. So uh, we're going to explain that at the end. So just stay tuned and we'll, we'll get going here. But before we do, so that the let me just explain that in 1968, it seems like it's always funny how things in the computer industry kind of build up. There's all these blocks that kind of fall into place as technology is approaching. So and one of the blocks that, that fell into place was in 1968. There was an article that was published by the ACM. And, and these are quotes by a man by the name of John Lyons. He was a professor at the University of South Wales and taught two courses in operating systems and their design and their how to build them. So what he was talking about here, this is these are quotes from him. He said, there seem to be three main appear, uh, approaches to teaching operating systems. First, there's the general principles approach, wherein you know you lay out some fundamental principles, you expound on them, you give illustration by references to various existing systems most of which seen are outside the student's immediate experience. And this approach is advocated by the cosign committee. But in our view, many students are not mature or experienced enough to profit from it. You don't actually get any hands-on. This is the type of operating system training that I got initially in a course uh, by a university was to look at OS 360. Well, first of all, OS 360, by the time I took it, was defunct. And second, there wasn't anybody around in the local area that was running it to, so to go see how the thing actually ran. So, yeah, we looked at bits and pieces of it, but never the full thing. So it was kind of disappointing, and I went off and studied operating systems on my own. So the second approach, this is the second part of his quote, the second approach is the building block, block approach where the students are enabled to synthesize a small scale or a toy operating system for themselves. And he says, while un un undoubtedly this can be a valuable exercise if properly organized, it cannot but fail to encompass the complexity and sophistication of real operating systems. And it's usually biased towards one aspect of an operating system design, such as process synchronization. Again, the operating system I took, that's what they concentrated on, was how to synchronize processes in, in the runtime. So <laughs> I know this one well. Uh, yeah, it was kind of disappointing on that course. So anyway, the third approach is the case study approach. And this one originally was recommended by the systems programming course in Curriculum 68. That would be for 1968. This was the report of the ACM Curriculum Committee on Computer Science that was published in March of 1968 in the issues of the communications of the ACM. And there's, this was, the third approach was always considered to be the holy grail because then you, you're, you're taking an operating system that exists it, it is it is something that you can get your hands on. You can you can compile it. You can modify it. You can play around with it. You can break it, and you can see what happens. That I mean, that's always the best way to learn. I mean, if you don't have a hands-on approach to learning something, it, it, concepts and esoteric design, nah, that's, <laughs> they're not gonna learn anything that way. You learn things by hard knocks, by actually getting your hands in there and and trying to do it. The second the second wheel that kind of turned was uh, Bell Labs had left the Multics uh, project, and Ken Thompson, Dennis Ritchie, and Douglas McElroy were all out looking for something to do, and they were all Bell Labs employees. So they were t they were con the considering. Kick, they were kicking around ideas for an operating system and what they thought it might need, and and they they went out looking for some hardware. But the 
the but you know they were they really wanted to go get their own machine but management was like nah you're going to have to show us that this is going to have some kind of uh some kind of benefit because uh, and we just came off of Multics. We spent a bunch of money. We didn't get anything out of it. So, yeah, they were a little burned, and they didn't really weren't too interested in this. So, uh, <laughs> they they came across a machine that was a PDP seven, which those were that would be like three year old vintage equipment, probably even four. So, I mean, it was pretty much obsolete. It wasn't being used for much. There might have been some people using it, but it was kind of eh, it's old stuff. No, we don't want to be on that one. So they kind of procured that one and started working on developing Unix, which they completed at the end of 1969 and released in the in January uh, of uh, 1970. So, yeah. Uh, and so in May 1975, Bell Labs released Unix System 6. This was a watermark release because it was the first Unix to be released outside of Bell Labs. And so this was their commercial offering. This was the one that would become PWB, the Programmer's Workbench, which would be a commercial version of Unix that AT&T could possibly sell. However, AT&T was constrained by their, uh, by their uh, monopoly decree. They were not allowed to enter the computer industry or any other industry other than communications in any way, shape, or form or they would be in trouble with their antitrust suit. So, uh, yeah, and so they they kind of pushed this over onto a wholly owned subsidiary called Western Electric, which they also offered it to universities for free, and they also gave them the source code. One of the interesting things about System 6 was not only was the source code there, but they could use, but universities could teach with it. They could use it in a classroom. It was permitted by the license. Well, John Lyons in 1976 caught on to that and went, hmm, I think I'm going to use this for one of to my classes because now I've got, I've got essentially a stage three. I can actually let my students get a hands-on and play with a real operating system that is, is functional. So he created this paper called The Commentary on Unix 6th Edition, uh, and he actually took the source code and went through it line by line and had text that explained what everything did. Uh, a lot of, there, this, this particular operating system still had assembler code in it. It was most, I'd say maybe 90% C, but it still had about 10% assembler in it. So it was kind of married to the PDP-11 architecture uh, because of the assembler, and, um, but that was fine. Uh, he was good with that. So he put this paper together, and he typeset it, uh, not using NROF, because uh, he didn't know how to use that at that time. This was new for him, too. He published a paper, and that paper basically, as we would say today, went viral. I mean, the universities were going crazy. They all wanted it. They, they were, like, grabbing this thing up, and they were, they were tearing it apart, looking at it, just having, you know, having a, a good old time with it. So it exploded. You know, here's what he said. He said, he said, not least among the charms and the virtues of the Unix time-sharing system is the compactness of the source code. The source code for the permanently re resident nucleus, that is the kernel, of the system when only a small number of peripheral devices are represented is, is pretty small. It's less than 9,000 lines of code. And he said, it's often been suggested that 1,000 lines of code represents a practical upper limit for a program which is understood and maintained by a single developer. So, and, and I paraphrase some of what, uh, what he said there, but basically what he's trying to say is that this is perfect. It's small. I can give it to a small team of students. They can go in and actually work. I can give them an assignment. They can make it work. They can bring it up and they can demonstrate it working on a PDP-11. So he, he it rapidly became the most copied paper in computer science ever. Uh, I mean, there, there were literally thousands and thousands and thousands of copies that were floating around Usenet at the time that you could, you could pull it off. So it's still around. You can find it today if you did a search for it. So in 1977, he published the work as a book. And, and <laughs> the, the funny thing is, this, is that that went viral too. Everybody was grabbing it, not just universities, but even people out in the system engineering field, the developers that wanted to understand better how the operating system worked. So it was flying off the shelves. They couldn't keep up. 
and couldn't keep up with the demand to publish the book. So John finally threw up his hands and he, and he talked to, uh, I don't know who at Bell Labs, but he finally got them to agree to publish the book for him because they were the only place that he could turn to that had printing facilities that were large enough to be able to meet the demand. And so in 1978, they were the only place that you could get the book was from AT&T Bell Labs. Well, things changed. In 1979, Bell Lab released Unix System 7. This was the first portable version of Unix. They removed all of the all of the assembler code, replaced it with C, and now it was able to work on DEC PDP-11s and also the new VAX machines that were rolling out from DEC. They also ported it to Intergraph and a bunch of other machines. So the, the Unix environment at 1979 started to expand rapidly into other computers. But... Western Electric was kind of worried. They they saw they saw the book from John Lyons, and they were worried because they knew there was proprietary code in the Unix kernel. They were worried, so what they did was they revoked the use of the source code in classrooms. So you, you could still get the source code, but you couldn't use it to teach, uh, and so that was and that was retroactive. So and that was kind of unfortunate because now. Universities can no longer use John Lyons' book or, or the source code from the Unix 6 or 7 in order to teach their classes. So what happened? What always happens? There's all these, all these copies of the photocopies of the book, and, and you, know, you know how the people are. So anyway, the students began meeting after hours, and they continued to use photocopy versions of both the book and the source code, and they would, they would study it on their own. They would, they would assign themselves projects and they would go and compile it, get working on the PDP-11 or the VAX, whatever they had handy. And other universities just said, well, okay, fine, we'll revert back to teaching theory. And I think that's the reason why my class in it was, was stuck, because this had already happened when I had taken my class. So I was kind of stuck. Fortunately, some professors like Andrew Tannenbaum in 1987 wrote a, a Unix-like operating system called Minix, and that was a, that allowed him to not only have an operating system available to teach operating system principles with, but allow users to get engaged with it, to kick the tires, play around, change things, and see how it would react. So uh, today, Minix is open source. It wasn't originally but it is today, it is open source under the BSD3 clause, and it's been that way since April the, April 2000. I think the current release is Minix 3.3, .3, uh, if uh, memory serves me right. I think, you know, you can still get it, you can still download it. In 1991, uh, Linus Torvalds released Linux for the x86-based PCs with for, full source code, but it wasn't at that time open source. There was a license under it, and... I, th I don't know how soon he did open source. It probably wasn't too long. Linux was that licensed under GPL2 as an open source license, and it still is today. So right there you have, you have one that you're free to use, uh, not only for your own purposes to change, but also you could use it to teach as well. But the, uh, there was forces inside of Bell Labs that wanted to get that book from Lyons uh, re republished. They wanted to, they were they had a whole bunch of things they wanted to add to it and update it with, and so Santa Cruz Operation owned the copyrights to Unix at that time. They finally did in 1996. They authorized the release of this 21 year old epic, uh, sixth edition source code and the commentary, and peer to peer communications published it. I believe. That is still the same book you will find today. It's still offered. It's still been in print all these years. Why was this important back then? I mean, the operating system's kind of propped up because why? Well, the corporations back then, like uh, Bell Labs, for example, they were interested in long-term goals. I mean, Bell Labs' this whole existence, and by the way, IBM's Watson Lab, and there's a number of other labs within IBM that do exactly the same thing. They were interested in long-term goals. Those, those labs were put in place to look down the road and to have technologies and products ready for production use 5, 10, 15 years down the road. So, yeah, we don't think that way anymore. We only think in terms of this quarter and next quarter. We don't, yeah, we're, it's like we're driving blind at 90 miles an hour. 
uh, or maybe we're just looking at the uh, hood ornament, you know, and, and trying to go as fast as we can. Well, sooner or later, that's going to pan out. I mean, that's short-sighted uh, uh, type of planning, and sooner or later, that will pan out. So those places were perfect to develop Unix, but they don't exist anymore. So where do you go? Who's going to do this? Um, where's the next generation operating system going to come from? And I think the best place to develop a new operating system is free and open source community. Why? Because as a community, we don't care about long-term goals. We work on stuff to try to improve things for the rest of the community. We try to build things around an idea, a concept, or a design, and, and then push those forward, get feedback, get help, get, other, get design changes that get incorporated into it, or, <laughs> or forked off into something else. So uh, I guess the question is, what's running on your computer? Uh, what kind of an opera? How old is the operating system baseline uh, that is running on your machine? What a, one more thing. So, what about this line? You are not expected to understand this. Where the heck did that come from? So, in the in the Unix system six code, there is a file. I think it's called slock.c, and it it is it used a quirk in the PDPs. Uh, ability to save registers from procedure calls, and and it only it was it was a short it was a hack basically to speed things up, and Dennis Ritchie put in there he, he said you are not expected to understand this, and, and when later on when they got to System Seven, and they were trying to make this portable to other systems that part of the code broke, and so they had to redesign that and take that hack out so. But that quote has always stuck. I don't. If you run into any people like me that's been around uh, for a while, they'll know what you're talking about when you say that, because it was it was taken originally as a challenge. Oh yeah, what do you mean? I'm not going to understand this. I'll prove you wrong. But that's not what the way Dennis meant when it meant it to be. He was saying that. I'm not going to test you on this because this was clearly a hack to try to fix a a, a quirk and you know a, a quirky uh, system, and so <laughs> that's all I really meant by it. But the but the community took it as a challenge to oh yeah I'm going to prove you wrong I'm going to understand how Unix works, and I think that's what played into all the downstream effort that went into systems that have followed since. I mean, without that seminal work, I, I wonder where we would be. Would we have OpenBSD? Would we have FreeBSD? Would we have all of those licenses that came down uh, from that? Now, they're not based on any actual Unix code, but they are based on elements of the design. And the only way they would have known that would have been from that book and others like it. Uh, and the second thing is, uh, you know, John Lyons did a heck of a service to the community by taking the time to go in and explain. I mean, if you're looking at assembler code, you can't always figure out what the heck it's doing unless you, unless you're running it and stepping through it, because it can be really obscure. Um, <laughs> and like that one, like where <laughs> it's doing a hack on the on the uh, references. Uh, from the procedure calls and saving them back into registers. You may not know that until you're running what it's actually doing. So, and the other thing is, is that, uh, yeah, if you get hands-on, things are going to make a whole lot more sense to you than trying to read them out of a book. But to have someone kind of guide you and lead you along, that's always the best way to learn, right? Because you're going to have questions. You're not going to understand, well, why is he moving this over here and then back again? Why is he doing that? There's reasons for all of those things, and sometimes it was just to cause a delay <laughs> long enough for the system to keep the to update the registers in memory. So yeah, I mean that there was things that were done like that in order to prevent us from overwriting code before it was uh, or overwriting registers before they were ready. But anyway, <laughs> enough of that. I hope you enjoyed this talk today. Um, I will leave you with one comment. I hope that that some of you get interested in operating systems because clearly this is something that needs to get done. I mean, I'm too old. I, I would love to jump in and do it, but I'm too old to do this now. Uh, but I would, I would love to get some of you involved in, in getting interested in this and taking something like this on to develop an operating system on a next generation scale. 
that will work with workloads that are coming down the line because uh, a lot of the workloads are changing rapidly, especially in edge uh, and cloud environments. Uh, there's uh, workloads that are very different in high performance computing that some of them are very experimental and, and to be honest, not well thought out. Um, but you can always improve on old designs. So anyway, that's all I had for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like and subscribe. Hope to see you all again real soon. Bye for now.